central to this passage is this idea of the brevity of the human life. I want to read you this quote from Pastor John Piper. John Piper said, One day America and all its presidents will be a footnote in history, but God's kingdom will never end. That in comparison to eternity, some of the most powerful people who have ever lived are but a footnote. While this might catch us off guard, there are many examples that prove this point. I want to pick on U.S. presidents for a second. The U.S. president throughout our history has been one of the most powerful people in the world. But so many of them we essentially know nothing about after they were president. When was the last time you thought of the effects on modern life from the policies of Chester A. Arthur? Or, sadly, a prominent whipping boy in presidential history. When was the last time you remembered that we even had a president named Millard Fillmore? It's a good example of people who at one time had more power than almost anybody on earth, and they're in the footnotes of history textbooks. The Bible does this too. Let me tell you about King Omri. King Omri is found in 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 21 to 28. And the fact that he only gets eight verses is something I'm going to come back to. King Omri had some real political accomplishments during his reign. He won a civil war to become king. He secured property for and built the capital city of Samaria for the northern kingdom. And he even conquered the nation of Moab. Now that's not even in the Bible, so you'll see where I'm going with this. We also have archaeological evidence that the Assyrian Empire would actually refer to the northern kingdom as Bit Amri which means the house of Omri. By the way, not in the Bible either. All of his accomplishments get four measly verses in the Bible. And like I just mentioned, some of them we only know through archaeology and weren't deemed important enough to put in the Bible. And what about, I said he gets eight verses. That's his first four verses. What do his last four verses get? He was really, really wicked and sinful. And he died. And you can read about him in another book. Central to this passage is the comparative brevity of human life. Comparative to God and comparative to eternity. And I highlight this with examples from our own history, but also the history of the Bible. That given time, people so important, we lose memory of them. And in the case of Omri, what gets as much press as his political victories, was his sinfulness and how he rejected the Lord. So what are we to learn from the brevity of human life? There are going to be three emphases in this psalm. Number one, that the comparative brevity of human life should cause us to have humility before the Lord. They should cause us to trust in the Lord. And thirdly, to strive for what has eternal value. Let's turn to the text. Psalm 39, beginning verses 1 to 3. I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle, so long as the wicked are in my presence. I was mute and silent. I held my peace to no avail, and my distress grew worse. My heart became hot within me. As I mused, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. 
This psalm begins with David's inner monologue. He has a problem and he believes he has a solution. And we're sort of brought into sort of midstream of his thoughts. And not many details are given to specifically what the problem is. But whatever that problem is, his solution is to be quiet. He is going to guard his ways. And specifically in what follows, we see that this is specifically in respect to his speech. So we see that he does not want to sin with his tongue, so he is going to guard his mouth with a muzzle. In addition to preventing further sin, it seems he also does this to avoid being attacked by, quote, the wicked who are in his presence. It seems that people are using his words to attack or accuse him. So, David is mute and silent. But what we see, specifically in verse 3, is that this does not solve the problem ultimately. He held his peace to no avail, and his distress grew worse. David's solution to not speak does not work, and the problem grows. And in his silence, David's anger grows His heart became hot and the fire burned. As one author about this writes, the more he reflected on his situation, the more he became exasperated. He could not prevent the water of his heart from boiling over, and when it did, he spoke. So what will David say? And to whom will he say it? Let's look at verses 4 and 5. O Lord, make me know my end, and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few handbreadths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. First thing I want us to notice here is to whom David speaks. when all of this anger and exasperation bubbles out of his heart, he cries out to the Lord. Time and time again, we see in the Psalms that David directs his fear, his anger, his calls for justice to the Lord. And we've seen throughout these psalms that we cry out to the Lord because he hears and he answers. It's a small but important detail for us that when you feel the anger boiling up inside, when the fear and anxiety and stress is causing your heart to bubble over, go to the Lord in prayer. But what does David cry to the Lord for? Notice that his first cry is not for justice or some other request of that type. Look what he says, verse 4. O Lord, make me know my end, and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. We expect David to say, Lord, rescue me, deliver me, and and we'll get there. But it's important to notice, and again, what is unique to this psalm, that David first cries for understanding, not about what's going on, but understanding how small he is. Now, first of all, remember King David But also we need to see that in his pain and in his anger, he's crying for the Lord to help him understand how fleeting he is. David compares his life, verse 5, that God has made to a few handbreadths. Or for us, we'd say a couple inches. 
right? Think of the space of your four fingers held together. Compared to God and his glory and his eternality, we are the width of four fingers. David personally understands this. He says, my lifetime is as nothing before you. And he pulls this out even further and says that in comparison to all human history, all mankind stands as a mere breath. I need you to feel the weight of that statement. That all mankind is a mere breath before the Lord. This must humble us before our God. Sometimes our view of the Lord is too small because our view of ourselves and others is too big. How can we be proud when all of human history is like a breath before the Lord? How can we put our trust in anything or anyone else if they are but a breath before God? We'll come back to that idea in a little bit. But first, in these verses, we must see the foundational nature of humility, of seeing ourselves before the Lord. If we are but inches before the Lord and as nothing compared to the Lord, we must be humble. And this leads to a first application of this idea of humility. Look at verse 6 with me. Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. If man goes about as a shadow with no significant substance, then we must pursue what is godly and eternal. David expresses this in a negative fashion of showing us the deficiencies of pursuing what is not eternal. What do people work for? For what are they in turmoil? David here speaks of people's pursuit of wealth and material goods. We strive for this, we work for this, but in the end, we do not know who will gather. Listen to the argument. Do not ultimately pursue wealth because you can't take it with you and you don't even know who will get it in the end. This reminds me of one of Jesus' parables. There's a rich man who has so much stuff, it won't fit in all his barns. Picking this up in Luke chapter 12, beginning of verse 18. And the man said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. David is saying this, Since your life is short, comparatively speaking, work for what truly matters, what is godly and eternal. To use the language of Jesus here, to lay up treasure in heaven and to be rich toward God. When we realize the comparative brevity of this life, it should cause us to be committed to do what is good, what is loving, what serves others, what is pleasing to God. This leads to the next application in verses 7 to 8. Look at that with me. And now, O Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. Here we see more what we might have expected earlier. But when we think about the comparative brevity of our life, One of the other applications of this is that our only hope can be in the Lord. David's trust is only in 
the Lord. David sees himself correctly, and also he sees all mankind correctly. And it pushes him to see that it is only through God that we can have hope. Again, when we recognize compared to the Lord, all mankind is but a breath, why would we place our hope in a breath? Our hope is only in the Lord. He alone is worthy of our trust and our hope. And here in verses, verse 8, we see two expressions of that hope. And that is forgiveness and justice. Look at verse 8 with me again. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. It is only God who can deliver us from our transgressions. It is only through God that we can be forgiven of our sins and reconciled to God through faith in Jesus Christ. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone that we can be delivered from our sins and have the hope of eternal life. David's hope is also found in God's justice. The idea is that God would show justice in not allowing David's attacker, the fool, to be victorious or to be seen as right. These fools, shorthand for those who have rejected God, mock and have contempt for David. David prays for justice to be done. When we understand the comparative brevity of the human life, when we understand properly our comparative smallness before the Lord, it is then and only then that we can find hope in God and his ability to save us, forgive us, and defend us. One of the applications of you understanding the comparative brevity of your life is to recognize the goodness of God and the need to rely on him as our source of hope. If we are but a breath, we cannot save ourselves. If we are but a breath, we cannot guarantee justice. If we are but a breath, we can only find our hope in trusting God. This leads to the second part of the psalm. And one of the things we're going to see is some similarities between the two halves. And there's going to be some overlapping ideas, but I also want to point out some of the unique differences in these last verses. And so let's look at verses 9 to 12 and see the connection between brevity of life and discipline. Let's look at verse 9. I am mute, I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. Here we see a second commitment to silence. But we're given a different reason for that silence. David is not opening his mouth because he knows that God is using this hardship as discipline. Look at verse 9. I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. As we spoke about this about two weeks ago, we need a category for hardship that is a tool of God's discipline in our lives to bring us to repentance and faith. And David clearly recognizes that God is at work in his life in the way of discipline. And this leads to, in verses 10 to 11, a call for God to end his discipline. Look at verses 10 and 11 with me. Remove your stroke from me. I am spent by the hostility of your hand. When you discipline a man with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. Surely all mankind is a mere breath. David requests that God end his discipline. There's a tension in the Bible that we recognize that God disciplines us, but yet he is also the only source of ending that discipline and reconciling us back to him. In a powerful statement, David says, I am spent by the hostility of your hand. 
God's discipline is heavy, and David is exhausted by it. But David understands that this is because of his sin. He says, when you discipline a man with rebukes for sin. He also recognizes that God's discipline of his people can mean that God removes what we improperly love. Look at verse 11. You consume like a moth what is dear to him. Literally, his desired thing. It's also possible to use this word to talk about wealth, and you'll see that in the NIV translation. Perhaps a connection to what was earlier said. But whatever it is, what I think is clear is that sometimes in God's discipline, he removes from us what we love more than him. And again, the poetic detail and the picture of you consume like a moth what is dear to him. This image of a moth again, points us to the words of Jesus. Jesus uses the same language in Matthew chapter 6. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. David again puts through the lens of the comparative brevity of human life. Look at verse 11, almost a complete repeat of verse 5. Surely all mankind is a mere breath. If I can tie these strands together, when we understand the comparative brevity of this life, we can humbly accept God's discipline, which can even include taking away what we improperly love. This humbling needs to lead us to acknowledging and confessing our sin, and this humbling needs to lead us to desire what is better and eternal. To borrow from Jesus instead of toiling after what moth will destroy, we store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. The brevity of life humbles us so that we are open to the discipline of God which will then lead us away from sin to a life that is pleasing to God. David finishes up this psalm in verses 12 to 13. Look at those last verses with me. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears. For I am a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers. Look away from me that I may smile again before I depart and am no more. David continues to cry to God to end this round of discipline. And it's a fascinating reality that David can both recognize that God is the one who is disciplining him, but also that God is the only one to whom he can turn while experiencing that discipline. And we must continue to hold these truths in tension, to humbly submit to God's discipline, but at the same time turning to God for deliverance and restoration. We see again the need for humility before the Lord and a heart that is quick to repent. At the end of verse 12, David uses a picture that runs throughout your Bible, and is based on the history of David's people Israel. In verse 12 he says, For I am a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers. This is in contrast to not being a citizen. And we think of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who traveled a nomadic life. Hebrews 11, 9 and 10 says it this way, By faith, He went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. 
We know that literally David was not a sojourner and he had a country and he was the king. So it must be speaking of a greater reality. David, and like the Hebrews passage I just read, understands that this world is not all that there is. This world is good. This world is a gift from God to be enjoyed, but it is not our ultimate home. Our citizenship, our true home, is with God in eternal life. When we understand the brevity of our lives as compared to God in eternal life, only then will we understand that we are sojourners, travelers, guests in this world. We love our lives here, but we know that this is not the end of the story. Peter is another place in the New Testament that picks up this imagery. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. As sojourners, we are to have an eternal perspective. And we commit to living lives of holiness that bring glory to God as we wait on the hope of Christ's return. As I was thinking on this idea of us as truly understanding ourselves as sojourners in this world, I couldn't help but think about the memorial service for Bob Owens and some comments I made as a part of his service. One of the things I'll remember about Bob is that he loved his RV. He was so proud to show it to you, and that thing was so clean and well-running. He took such good care of it. And he used it to serve others. Him and Trinette would hop in that bad boy, and they would travel and serve others greatly. But you know what Bob knew about that RV? He knew it wasn't his real home. And I think of that when I think about how we live in this world. We take care of the world that God has given to us as a gift, just like Bob took care of his RV. And we use our time in this world, like Bob used his time in his RV to serve others, to do what matters to Jesus. But at the end of the day, we know it's not our eternal home. God gave us this life to enjoy. We are to take care of it and use it to serve others. But this is not our final home. We live knowing that those who trust in Christ have our citizenship in heaven where we will be with God for eternity. A couple thoughts as we conclude this morning. Number one, the comparable brevity of human life should build into us a deep humility before the Lord. Compared to the Lord, we are but a breath. Therefore, we must be humble. In specific, we must have humility and repentance when we are experiencing the discipline of God. God's people are a humble people. God's people are a contrite and repentant people. And one of the ways we check our hearts is to understand the comparative brevity of our lives. Secondly, the comparable comparable brevity of human life shows us that only God is worthy of our trust and our only source of hope. No one and no thing in this world can be the source of our hope and trust. Again, that idea of all mankind before the Lord is but a breath. Don't miss the weight of that statement. And that one of the applications of that is that only God 
is our hope. Thirdly, the comparable brevity of human life causes us to have an eternal perspective to this life. When we understand eternity and that this world is not our ultimate home, we will truly desire to store our treasures in heaven. And as is specifically mentioned in this psalm, we see the limits and the idolatry that wealth can be. We will desire to worship the Lord and to serve others with the time that we have. This connects with one of my favorite verses from the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Or to use the words of Jesus, when we understand the brevity of our lives and the truth of eternal life, we will dedicate ourselves to bearing fruit that will last. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Psalm 39. That we would find true life in humbling ourselves before you. That we would have a clear and accurate picture of who we are before you. And that we would humble ourselves under you. God, that we would not put our hope and trust in anything besides you and that our hope of forgiveness and eternal life and justice is found in you and you alone and that we would truly desire to store up our treasures in heaven where moth and rust will not destroy. That we would truly live lives that bring about fruit that lasts. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching this video from Hillside Evangelical Free Church. Our hope is that these resources will help you grow as a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. We're located in Green Bank, Washington on Whidbey Island. And if you live in the area and are looking for a church home, we'd love to have you join us. You can find out more information at our website at hillside-efc.com.